Well, hello and welcome to the unofficial Unreal Engine podcast, where we talk about all things Unreal Engine and also adding cognition to Charles Dickens. We're your hosts. My name's Alex, and under me or next to me is <laughs> Jacob. Uh, good to be back here. I, I gotta say, though, uh, this is one of your more uh, coherent openings when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, your, your your choice of words. So I, I think people already get an idea what we're going to talk about. But before we do that, make sure you like, rate, subscribe, all of those things. Comment. We get some great feedback on YouTube. I wish we could get more feedback from the other platforms. Maybe that's something we should look into. Or you can send us an email. I don't know if people still do that for podcasts. I've, but, uh, I've hey, totally forgotten what our email is, Jacob. It would be uepodcast at gmail.com. Mm, Feel free. I believe you. <laughs> Shoot that over. Maybe you'll email someone else, but uh, the, the ethos will get it to us. Anyways, we have a special guest with us tonight, Alex. We do have a special guest. Uh, really excited to welcome uh, Eugene Yen to the podcast, who I have known for a few years. There's lots and lots of things I would like to say about her, but let's start by having her introduce herself. Welcome, June. Hi. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eugene Yen, but I usually go by just June. And yeah, happy to be here. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm already hinting what I'm going to to share it with um yeah so uh mm -hmm. june we always need to be very careful for our audio listeners who sometimes feel left out so why oh, don't you right. tell everyone what's behind you <laughs> so yeah so the thing behind me is our um our poster for the the show that we're going to talk about uh is a uh, christmas carol vr yeah we we've we've been chatting about this on the podcast i mean it seems like things have been going great at, and uh, we're going to dive into it. I feel like this is an annual tradition now is to talk about everything, everything you guys are doing uh, uh, with with this, because each year you get to kind of redo it, right? And and use the latest tech. So definitely excited to get into that. But before that, we have a, a little something that we, we like to do with guests on the podcast. Essentially, it's just a, a word association, right? So I'm going to say a word. You're just gonna say the first word that comes to your head. It's it's no pressure, but we are putting you on the spot. So to you know, uh, it, it it goes both ways. Um, so just gonna say a word. First thing that comes to your head, right? Okay. Yeah. And and uh, still, uh, keep in mind that English is my second language, so yeah. it no, might come out weird. The is it, I mean, the first <laughs> word that comes to mind, it doesn't need to be in English. Totally fine. <laughs> yeah. Really? That's true. That's true. So I, I can just. Okay. Whatever you and want. We will have I mean, like spend, okay, spend the, the universe. The, the, those listeners of our podcast who know the words you're speaking will be so thrilled. It'll be a great Easter egg. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go okay, for it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So first word, home. Linko. <laughs> okay. Uh work. A real. Food. So full. Travel. Ah, uh, plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, virtual production. Microphone. Virtual reality. Oculus. Oh my god, that's no. <laughs> so much like an advertisement. Oh, no. oh no. All right. Last one. Last one. Unreal Engine. Um. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> we we have a few questions as well and these are open-ended um do you do you drink coffee or tea tea what, what kind of tea is your favorite or how oh, do you my take favorite it is oolong. how do i take it yeah you know uh, like the british have a, a a ritual around it I, i'm not a tea person so i don't really know um, to be honest but how, how do you prepare your tea, tea? I'm a I'm a pretty um open-minded tea person. I I, I yeah. always drink tea. Um, well, I I can I can do it very delicated, or I can just throw a tea bag and <laughs> live it be there for eight hours, and I will still drink that kind of there water. <laughs> still call <laughs> still call it tea. You know, it's it's kind of funny. We we've had a lot of folks who who have you know very uh, uh what's the word I'm looking for very kind of religious coffee routines. But I, I'm with you that like 
there's there's different coffee for different times and places yeah you know? I, I i believe in that <laughs> anyway <-11 Anyways>. coffee <laughs> Okay, two more questions, and and then we're, we're going to get on to the to the meat here. But what's your favorite time of day? Are you a morning person or a night person? Oh, I like um, the time before sunset. Ah, okay. And uh, when was when was the last uh, time you laughed, and and what was it that you laughed at? Um. Well, it's a very, uh, it's a very normal scenario. I just napped on a meme. At a meme? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember what the meme was? Yeah. What was the meme? Uh, it's it's something with a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Oh, the 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 one uh, recently I'm I'm really um, into one series of memes. Uh, it, it's about a cat, and um, uh, the cat's owner turns this cat into um various different kind of animals just like you know because cat can be any shape and he just kind of cut oh, it yeah, and yeah. rotate it a little bit and makes into dinosaurs and penguins and, <laughs> and stuff. oh actually I've seen, i know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, like, I, I know it. exactly what you're talking about i've seen i know like someone TikTok is going to say on tiktok where they like crops the cat into like a t-rex yeah, 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 like... yeah I've seen that. that's good oh. that's good i i i i i, I like those too all right <laughs> Love it. Thank you for subjecting yourself to to our, uh, uh, you know, we're gathering our, our some great open. insight from all of our guests. We're going to feed it into an AI someday. Something wonderful is going to pop out. <laughs> we're going to know how everyone takes their tea and coffee. It just AI is going to listen to you know uh, the first three words you say, and it's going to say, "Ah, this person likes it. Yeah. Likes it, you know, black or or with." I'm going uh, to get a lot of Oculus and tea advertisement. Oh yeah, <laughs> after the show. <laughs> All right. Well, Alex, what do we want to get into? Well, uh, certainly June and I are very excited to give like a proper backstage tour of all the Christmas Carol stuff. Uh, our listeners who have been with us for a while will remember last year we had Ari Tar and Debbie Deer on the podcast and they got to speak at length about what it was like for them as performers to come in and do this show. And we definitely did have some people after that being like, awesome episode would love to know more about the technical side and what it's like for the development team to make that happen so we're going to dive into that with june we do feel because it's our last episode of the year we should cover a little bit of unreal engine news um one thing i want to make sure everyone knows is it is the annual uh holiday sale on the epic game store where instead of there being one free game every thursday there's a free game every day so Pop oh. into your Epic Games Store account, grab those free games. <laughs> Here I am opening it right now. That's yeah. that's how motivated I am by that. And then Whoops. there was um, another lawsuit. We talked a little bit about the Epic versus Apple one, which uh, unfortunately Epic summarily lost. This was about Apple's 30% uh, charge on the App Store and Fortnite getting kicked off and you know Epic saying, hey, it's ridiculous to take a 30% cut of everything. Credit cards don't do that, et cetera, et cetera. But then they did something similar with Google and the results were a little different. Tell us about it, Jacob. Yeah. I, I'm going to do my best to to summarize uh, some of the details here, but um, definitely recommend you kind of do some some research on your own to to look through it. There's a lot of information here. Um, for, the, for those who kind of don't know the backstory on this, uh, maybe, I don't know, I want to say two years, three years ago now, Apple, or <laughs> getting ahead of myself, Tim Sweeney. Uh, I think, I think the Tim, you know, got me to Apple in some weird association. Um, but, uh, uh, about two or three years ago, uh, Tim Sweeney, you know, said that they were going to go all out to fight lawsuits against tech companies who were abusing marketplace privileges. Um, the justification for this was, uh, well, I think there was an external justification and an internal one. What was said is that um, you know, Google and Apple have unfair monopolies over the distribution of applications on their devices, which I think is probably generally true. Um, the kind of backstory to it, though, was that Fortnite at the time, um, you know, you buy V bucks on Fortnite on PC, you're paying dollars directly to Epic. Now, if you buy those same V-Bucks on an iPhone, 
because Apple's going to come in and take a, I don't know what it is on, on Apple devices. I think it's like 20%. I think it's 30%. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe 30% charge on any transaction that happens on an Apple device, essentially, which is pretty wild to be honest. Um, and so essentially the, you know, what Apple does is that if you have an application that does any sort of microtransaction, such as like buying V bucks or, you know, purchasing a subscription through an application, you a can't link to an external site to, to make the purchase. You can't use a different payment processor. So like you can't have an app approved on the Apple app store without using Apple's process, you know, payment processor and accepting the fees. And so what that meant is that Epic's just losing dollars for every user who goes to an iPhone to buy V-Bucks instead of goes to their PC. And rightfully, they were a little upset about that. Um, and, you know, whether or not you want to believe the the larger argument about uh, uh, the, you know, uh, ethics of, you know, monopolies in this, in this kind of industry, uh, I think you can see that this doesn't make sense, right? Uh, so... Epic announced that they were going to go all out, all out and sue Apple. And they started a big campaign. It was called Free Fortnite. And they they kind of won. They kind of lost. It was pretty much a 50-50 settlement where they said, yeah, I mean, Apple might not be the best, but like they're not acting, you know, explicitly against the the rule of the law, I guess, was more or less the the conclusion of that. Nothing really came out. Now, at that time, there was an ongoing lawsuit with Google for the same thing. They sued both of them around the same time. And the Google lawsuit um, just outright failed at that time, is my understanding. And more recently, uh, they renewed or they appealed the lawsuit or there was something to that extent um, where they filed, I, I think it was a, a new filing. And so recently they were in court and a court ruled uh, in favor of Epic, that Google does have a monopoly on App Store, um, on Android devices, um, that is leveraging unfairly in a number of cases. Now, this is recent, and this is a good thing. The fact that a court ruled that, yes, Google has unfair advantages over consumers on their platform, that's a good thing. Um, now, apparently at the same time, and I'm trying my best to extract this information from a few articles. So, you know, bear with me if I, if I get this wrong, but at the same time, Epic had additional, you know, uh, lawsuits, sorry, uh, Google had additional lawsuits to this extent that they were handling in, in courts. And so <laughs> they said, uh, multiple state attorney generals essentially decided that because there were so many cases in the pipeline, because this court ruled in favor of Epic and said, yes, you are fighting, or this is unfair monopoly, Google just decided to go ahead and settle all of these cases with the state attorney generals. And the outcome of that was that Google agreed to pay $700 million um, to, I, I believe, like to the to the state, I want to say. It doesn't actually say where they're paying the 700 million. I guess it doesn't really matter. Um for Google. So this dollars. is like this is like <laughs> nothing dollars for, yeah. for Google. Uh I mean look, it's a lot of money, but it's not gonna break the bank for Google. Um there's a few other cases in here um where Supposedly, this says that they're going to pay $629 million to consumers that might have overpaid for apps um, that had reasonable alternatives. Um, and then there's a whole lot of updates that Google settled to make to the App Store uh, to the effect of, you know, kind of resolving this issue. Now, so I'll read you a few examples here. There's like 10 of these. Uh, for seven years, Google will continue to technically enable Android to allow the installation of third-party apps on mobile devices through means other than Google Play, is an example. Uh, or um, for five years, Google won't make developers offer their best prices to customers who pick Google Play 
and Google Play billing. And they're gonna allow people to add additional billing types. Now, when you read through this, it's like, well, there's a lot here. They all have expiration dates is I guess the biggest takeaway is that like Google agreed to do this for like five years it, in the US only, by the way. Like, so if you're in Europe, well, actually, Europe kind of has way stronger laws about this, and you can argue all day about EU verdicts to this extent. Um, but in the US, essentially, it said for four to five years, they'll agree to like, you know, play nice, essentially. They pay basically no money for Google. Like, it's, this is not a big enough settlement. Um, and so, like, Essentially, what they're doing is kind of delaying this verdict for another five to six years before they have to make any permanent changes to the platform or or really do anything substantial. Like they'll offer quote unquote alternatives. We don't really know what that means. Now, I, I think if you're looking at this, it's still a good outcome because it sets a precedent for courts ruling on cases like this. Um, however, you know, was this like the knockout blow to Google's monopoly, quote unquote? No, definitely not. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone would see it that way. Um, but hopefully, you know, we see some meaningful change here. Um, doesn't solve, you know, the Apple App Store, of course. Um, but, you know, progress is progress. So that's how I would prefer to take it. So any thoughts here, Alex? I just you know, monologued as I, as I do on this podcast, but no, that, I mean, that sounds pretty much like the shape of it to me. Um, I, I really hope this is a good precedent, um, not just, you know, for Apple, but it's always seemed ridiculous to me that 30% is the cut that is so standard. It was also very strange when uh, Mark Zuckerberg a couple of years ago was talking about the meta app store as like this beacon of hope where things were going to be different. And he was specifically bad mouthing like Apple's 30% cut without acknowledging the fact that meta does exactly the same thing. And there have been uh, some really, really good uh, podcasts with people like Kent Baia, Voices of VR with folks like um, six and um, there's one going on right now with Andre Elijah and developers who uh, have talked about how hard it is to make a profit specifically with Meta's model because VR is already a very difficult industry to make a profit with. Um, someone else would be like, um, oh, I'm blinking on his name, but big screen beyond where something like that, where you're licensing movies to play in VR, there's already like a licensing fee for that. So then 30% on top of that, you know, you're losing a lot of money. And then if a company like Meta, for example, swoops in and does their own first party solution where they're like, we're going to offer movies or we're going to offer a fitness app or we're going to offer, you yeah. know, Supernatural and, and make it so that all other health apps are much uh, it's much harder for them to compete on the store because the first party apps don't need to have that 30% cut and the other ones do. It's just very anti-competitive. It makes it very hard for a new company to kind of rise up and challenge anything that isn't already being done internally. Uh, so yeah. anything that starts to cut down on that 30% cut, I think is good for the world and the industry and competition and startups. But, um, you know, yeah, we'll see I mean, where this goes. Yeah. One of these is wild. Like the, the last one I mentioned, um, Google agrees for five years to not make developers offer their best prices to consumers who choose Google Play. It's yeah. like the most classic strong arming like, <laughs> tactic ever. Like, yeah, you know, you can use Google Play as long as, you know, it's the best price on Google Play. Because if you put it anywhere else, you can't use Google Play. Like yeah. that's... Am that's and Amazon's funny. famous for that too. Like there's a yeah. lot of times where Amazon won't let you list physical products at a lower price uh, somewhere else if you're listing it on Amazon as well. Like it's very, yeah, strong arm. Um, June, do you have any thoughts on all this craziness? Um, not really. I mean, uh, it feels like it's uh, it's a bigger problem with, um, yeah, with the whole system. If there is like a better or a healthier uh, system that it, um, that can exist, um, it basically will benefit both sides, right? It's not just like the the marketing or the platform side will lose if we, if they make a healthier system. Um, it's not like um, the platform is the only person that um, I mean, more uh, more content basically benefits the platform. So there should be like a, a win win situation to have a healthier and more that makes sense. You would think, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. 
And June, of course, <laughs> no, is, June's from um, Taiwan, where HTC is headquartered. And like, I think a lot of us feel like we'd love to see HTC uh, as already an underdog, able to really come up and challenge uh, companies like Meta, they definitely don't have the same number of resources and there's a lot of a extra challenges they have there. And by the way, June, I'm curious, would you say Taiwan in general is very supportive or excited about HTC as a company? How do you think that compares to the perspective in the US? <laughs> oh, I think no. Actually, I think, it, but, but it's largely not just, not. It, it's not, uh, not, not about the company itself, it's more about the political situation uh, in Taiwan and HTC's background is more like linked to um, a sensitive <laughs> political uh, gotcha. yeah, status yeah. and things. So yeah, people in Taiwan with certain um, political preferences will either love or hate the company based on that, not based on their product or any of their servers. Interesting. Yeah, that is very interesting. Wow. Yeah. On a lighter note, should we talk about some Christmas Carol? <laughs> wow, that that was a rough transition. I'm sorry. Look, look, I, I would have let you have it, but man, you really kind of went all the way on that. Not not one of my better segues for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but hey, let's talk about Christmas. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So just to set this up a little bit, um, and actually, you know what? Uh I'm I'm really tempted because uh, Zoom just gave me a little pop up that was like, "Do you want to go live on YouTube with this?" And it's like, "Well, we could, but I have no idea what would happen, so I'm not going to at the moment. Um, maybe in the middle I'll do it, and I'm not going to tell anyone we're live on YouTube, but it'll at the very least be like a backup recording." Anyways, um, so uh, let's talk a little bit first about June's involvement in the project because um, she wasn't just involved for the 2023 production, not just the 2022 production. Uh, June has been a part of this since the very beginning. Um, we met in May of 2021. Um, I grabbed her fresh out of architecture school. I'm guessing June probably thought we would mostly be doing architecture projects. And before long, uh, she was being asked to learn Marvelous Designer and do costumes and do motion capture and do all these other things in Unreal. Uh, June, do you want to talk a little bit about your your time with Christmas Carol over the years? Yeah, it's it's pretty fun. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun journey for me. Um, yeah, like right uh, as Alex mentioned, right after I graduated from architecture school, I started to learn how to make a uh, closed model, <laughs> 3D closed modeling. Um, and, and yeah, I didn't expect that would be my first kind of uh, work experience in the US, but that's pretty interesting. So we started with um, collaborating with actors, um, Actors Theater of Louisville. So they will be, they will be like traditional theater designers. They designed a set and um give the um uh sketch of like the original costume design and everything and uh my my first job was to just transform it into the digital form and try to make it work on the metahuman skeleton and learn like how to do weight planting and everything and yeah and it was the first um kind of the most complicated um a real project i ever participated in and interestingly, it continues to be the most complicated project I participated every year <laughs> after that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And June, what are some of the changes that we made this year in particular compared to last year? You know, things like what version of Unreal are oh, we yeah, now in like, and stuff like that? I think it's even more, um, I think it's even easier to say what is the same <laughs> than what is different. Yeah. Yeah, we changed from uh, 4.27 to 5.2, and we were still kind of pushing to make it into 5.3, but it's still ongoing. Um, but, but yeah, that, that changes everything, basically. <laughs> and also we changed from, so uh, in previous years, we were working um, based on the um, uh, advanced framework uh, plugin or like the advanced framework uh, template. And this year we kind of start from scratch. Uh, so like the multiplayer system, we're not even using an actual multiplayer session uh, or even uh, any online subsystem. We're kind of do the replication from scratch based on OSC signal and the WebSocket. Uh, everything is from scratch. We don't have an online subsystem at all. And yeah. also, yeah, and, and wait, also, wait. We got to pause that. there because I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off because I, I, I got to poke on this a little bit. So 
why why did you do that and well I here we'll start at the beginning mm-hmm. what does that mean for the 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 listener or the viewer who doesn't know anything about multiplayer or anything in unreal why did you do that and you know <laughs> what did it take to get that done yeah well uh there, there are several reasons and some of them might not um make sense for all the scenarios but for us it's kind of <laughs> all the reasons uh one of the problem is that uh, at first we were trying to work it on a uh, cloud computing uh core weave and in in our version we call it graphical and just for some reason it's still unknown but uh, whenever we try to run that our project on that uh, cloud computing system. Um, if we are doing a, uh, a traditional multiplayer session, it just have like a 50 to 70 percent random crash <laughs> mm. for whatever reason. But if we do it as, as uh, a single player, uh, it almost always uh, stable. So that I think that's the first biggest issue, just because we couldn't figure out why. And the second is also because when we load um, from levels to levels, we know that in the traditional multiplayer uh, or the replication system, um, the host will need to load everything first, and then we will let the client load everything. That the client will then um, like keep uh, up on the host. So basically, everything will be slower. But if everything is, if everyone is running their own single player session and we just like send a signal from outside of the game to say that, okay, now you are going to go to the next step, um, things will just go faster. And we kind of, I think also because we are doing uh, multiplayer on our own, so we are very selective of like what are the things we want to replicate and what are the things we don't want. So we, we can make um, everyone's experience very customized. Like we have our uh, AI <laughs> robot, the AI Dickens in our session. We let everyone have their own AI robot. Oh, okay. Mm-mm. Yeah. So, and, go ahead, yeah. Jacob. No, I, I was just going to ask. Um, all right. So, if if the the system you worked out with with levels, which seems very interesting, so it's just an event driven approach, and and you're kind of just instructing instances to to do these things. Why mm-hmm. is it that someone would choose this approach over? A standard multiplayer, you know, in a practical like, why doesn't everyone do this? I guess is the question. Oh, because that's very. I mean, there's uh, the standard beauty player has a lot of benefit. Like, um, we we kind of have to very manually build things up, uh, and you can imagine like um, in a traditional beauty player um, um, scenario, there are a lot of things that are already replicated, like the other players. Uh, movement, their transition, their movement, and we can just check that, oh, I want its animation to be replicated, and then it's replicated for everyone. But for us, we need to replicate everything. We need to send out the um, the location and the rotation and the scale. Yeah. And and we have to send it to the, the host instance first, and then we have to write it so the host can send it to everyone. And we also still need to do the check that the uh, when they got the event, they will not got the event from themselves. Like, I don't need to uh, replicate my movement to myself again. It's just going to make myself busy, things like that. So uh, there's still a lot of benefit. Yeah, that's interesting. That being said, though, there are definitely some benefits to the OSC method. One thing, for example, is it's very easy to pick anything we want and have it replicate. Um, and we don't have to deal with all the different ways that, you know, multicasting and all that works in Unreal. Uh, we can also be very specific about how often we're sending data to everyone, really just by using the event tick of our like client host OSC system. So, for example, you know, people use Fortnite like as, as an example of like 100 people. That's kind of like the typical number of people you can get in a shard of a, uh, the same experience. We could very easily get more than that um, by very just strategically dialing up or down the event tick of like how often we're getting everyone's information about where they are and which queues are firing and all that, which is kind of interesting. So in theory, we could have like 10,000 people, but maybe the load of that would mean that everyone only sends an update for where they are like once per second. And then we're like lurping between that. So it wouldn't be great for like uh, a first person shooter where you really do want that split second kind of latency, but for a live show, a live concert where maybe the interaction doesn't need 
need to be quite that responsive, um, that could work. Uh, I also want to call out the fact that one thing that's fun about how we do Christmas Carol every year is that we're always building on the projects that we have done that year. So for example, um, when June and I both worked on the Orchard Off Broadway in the summer of last year, that was the first time where we actually started using OSC as part of a live show. And so with that, everyone who came to see the live show was on Core Weave, Pixel streaming their version of the virtual version of the Orchard Off Broadway. And that was the first time we realized like, oh, hey, they don't actually need to be in multiplayer. We can just send this OSC signal uh, to everyone. And as long as they all receive the same signal at the same time, they'll get the cues for when the show starts and when they move from our virtual uh, Brushnikov Arts Center into the hall. And the cool thing too was that OSC signal, which is very common in live entertainment, was able to do two things. It was able to send a signal to the physical venue as well as the virtual venue. Um, and then after being like, hey, OSC is pretty cool. You can do some, you know, neat kind of multiplayer-esque stuff with it. We kind of took it to the next level for Christmas Carol last year, where we then allowed that to, we, we replicated our cue board so we could send all the different signals that we wanted uh, from a free application called Touch OSC. So if like the host went down, for example, multiplayer would stop working because we still were using some traditional multiplayer last year. So you'd lose sight of where everyone else was, but we could actually keep the show going by using Touch OSC to continue to send out the cues to everyone of exactly where they should be in the show. Um, and then we went even further with OSC this year. June, what did we do with OSC for our Four Seasons project, which podcast listeners know a little bit about already? Yeah, so yeah, so for Four Seasons, we uh, it's kind of our starting point of trying to use OSC to uh, fake the multiplayer experience. So yeah, we use OSC to um, to send the um, every. Um, and the other players headset location and rotation to all the other headsets. So basically we fake the, we start to fake uh, other pawn or other players uh, in that. And we also use uh, OSC to send out, um, it's kind of the same, just uh, send out like the host uh, signals for everyone to go to the next uh, location or uh, show a specific, like show the food print on the floor so everyone know to go there um yeah it's it's basically like a very simplified version of our christmas carol OSC multiplayer system yeah oh and and yeah a benefit of that is uh alex already mentioned it briefly is that because in a traditional multiplayer session if the host go down uh, everyone basically will be kicked out of the session so uh and that is the moment we lose everyone <laughs> but in this session in, in our and in our current uh system if the host crash we're like uh, we're um everyone will be fine and we can secretly <laughs> reboot the host and and we can just adjust the host to be at the uh like the queue or the status we want it to be and nobody will notice that's that. interesting so <laughs> What you're saying is that because the clients are standalone and just mm -hmm. receiving events, it just says, hey, I haven't received events, just keeps on going. Yeah. You reboot the host and it's able to start firing those events again. And then all of your other instances just catch on and, and go from there. Yeah, I think it's also interesting because we are separating our um, uh, multiplayer signals or uh, in, into various different little modules. So like our uh, Rococo, uh, our body movement, um, what is that, uh, the, the motion capture data, it's going through a different system called Protocast. So even if the host uh, instance is done, the body animation will continue to go on. And our audio is also not going through the multiplayer, any multiplayer session. It's going through Agora. It's a, and, and also a, a separated audio service. So, um, which so we used for it, the first time for the orchard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So we kind of learned from there that that's an option. So we use that to replicate the, the voice. So, um, so if, if server goes down, everything else will just continue to happen. And we can uh, buy some time to fix it, and nobody will notice until the next queue. And we just have to fix the host, come back to life, and then go to the next queue. And for everyone else, it will feel very smooth, just like everyone else was stuck at the, on the air, air the, in the air for a moment. That, but actually, we, yeah, we don't really care about others that much, so well, it's fine. It, but 
but things like Agora could also still keep running. So like this hasn't even yeah. happened yet this year, but if we really needed like one of the actors or anyone to make an announcement, we have like keyboard keys to like unmute yourself and someone can say like, oh, pardon me, ladies and gentlemen, we have a brief technical difficulty. We'll be back in shortly. Um, so we have that ability, even if everyone is like disconnected, um, which is very nice just for like keeping everyone on the same page and, you know, reducing that audience friction as much as possible. Because when we were using traditional multiplayer, if our server crashed and everyone was kicked out, we would just kind of hope they could come back in. And we did actually have a way to do some audio broadcasts as well um, using the, the pixel streaming methods that we had. But it was like, it, it was so frustrating, particularly because when this project lived in Unreal Engine 4.27, it would take forever. Like the the Unreal Editor version of the project would take like 30 minutes to open up. And even the packaged version would take like a few minutes to open even on our most powerful computer. So it's been really nice being in 5.2 this year where everything is just much, much, much faster. Yeah, that's very cool. Okay, so I, I totally cut you off when you're going <laughs> through your list of changes because I thought that was an interesting point we needed to chat about. But let's keep going. Like what else? what else changed this year? Right. Oh, this year. Oh, one one major change this year is also that uh, we put the actors into the world. So before that, uh, we we have Ari as our main actor. Uh, he performs with a motion capture suit and lifelink face. So he's not actually inside the game. He is uh, performing. He can see a screen of himself working 2D on on the screen, but he's not like in headset and and in the world. But this year we use uh, MetaQuest Pro's facial tracking, so he's actually in the world and he can look from the first person point of view from the characters. And it's also an, uh, an interesting challenge. It's also uh, we made him perform two avatars at the same time, so he needs to jump back and forth between the two avatars. He also has like a third person view avatar, so a uh, third person view. He can perform both avatar at the same time which is so complicated, I cannot even imagine how it works, but yeah, he did a great you got, job. You gotta try, because <laughs> this is like, all I'm seeing in my head is, is like Gollum, you know, like... Uh... Yeah. It's a lot mm -hmm. like that. And I think we are going to, we're going to share our screen and do a little bit of a demonstration yeah, of some of this sure. stuff. Um, but like, yeah, you have to imagine, like, imagine you're a puppeteer, but you have multiple puppets and everyone can see you. And that's like another character. And sometimes you're like throwing a black sheet over yourself to make yourself invisible. And like the cognitive load of all the things that uh, Ari has to be doing is is really remarkable. So we're always impressed when we're like, hey, Ari, we're thinking maybe this thing. And uh, David Gotchfeld, who's our director, was the one who wanted to try like multiple avatars this year instead of one avatar and we're always like really willing for Ari to push back and be like you know what guys it sounds cool that's too much and to his credit he hasn't said that yet so you know god knows what we'll come up with next year <laughs> but so far he's handling it all pretty well uh, one thing we did to bring down his his cognitive load a little bit this year was uh, AI. So um, June already alluded to it a little bit, but earlier this year we were doing a project uh, for London Tech Week with Vodafone and Infinite Reality, and this was about using in-world AI to have a metahuman who could speak to you and tell you about a car, and you know have a car configurator and change the colors and tell you about mileage and and all that stuff. And so we got really inspired doing this client work, thinking, okay, how could this also work for uh, theater. And one thing that's definitely been a challenge for our actors in the past has been something like, hey, can you guys actually go into the show like, and make sure everyone's okay and talk to them ahead of time uh, before you're in character and do kind of like this ushering or house management stuff, um, which, you know, like you want actors to really just be able to focus on performing the roles. So the opportunity to say, can we take Ari's voice and capture that with Eleven Labs? Can we take all the ways that he performs as Charles Dickens and capture that with in-world AI and add in all this fun information about like agile ends and all that. And we've done this live demonstration of our AI Dickens on the podcast uh, for anyone who wants to go back and check that out. But what that's been great for for this year is, you know, about 10 minutes before the show starts, um, we're able to trigger this AI Dickens who comes in and you can just have a conversation with him. You can speak naturally with your voice or type into a keyboard and, uh, it's he's aware that he is like a virtual representation of Charles Dickens based on the performance of Ari Tar and that he's created by Agile Lens. And he can also tell you about his favorite oil lamp from the 1800s. So it's a really trippy experience. Um, how did that feel to you, June, going through that whole process with him? 
Yeah, that's really fun to to chat with AI because I always <laughs> take too long to chat with him whenever I do like a QA or testing, <laughs> just staying that process for way too long. But I think one, uh, I think using Ari's voice is is really important. Mm -hmm. Before that, he well, what how how interesting? Uh, I mean, the content is interesting. Or like the content is the same, but with the robot voice, it just feel like you're talking to a robot. But with uh, I think Eleven Lab really did a great job uh, mm -hmm. transforming Ari's voice into on, onto the generated content. It feels much more like you're talking to a real person, <laughs> and just with, just with the the mindset that you are actually talking to a robot makes whatever his react um, always interesting. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. Yeah. And it's really trippy the way the training works too. I'll, I'll mention briefly that um, earlier when June and I were doing these experiments, we were both stuck at JFK waiting for a flight all day long. And so we started to dive into things like 11 labs and training a voice and all that. And we started with uh, a, a voice that I did and I just went off in a corner and recorded something. And of course there was all this background noise from the airport. And what's interesting is that all gets incorporated into the voice. So then when it was generating audio that sounded like me, it also sounded like there was a bunch of people in the background. Similarly, if we took an audio clip of Ari, when he bounces between different voices and he's not just playing Dickens, it's weird that you have AI Dickens. He'll, he'll be talking and he sounds like Dickens and suddenly his voice will go very high because it's <laughs> taking like some information from, you know, a, a little audio clip when he, he sounded like another character. So it's such a trippy thing to play with. I do want to mention, by the way, too, we are compensating Ari for this. We're not just like stealing his likeness and being like, ha ha, money, money, money. Um, we want to set a good precedent here that anytime you're taking a performer's hard work with, you know, their voice, their likeness, how they've developed a character, that we are paying him for every single you know, show where we're selling tickets and, and using that. So we hope uh, other companies will do the same. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. So what did Ari have to do specifically for this? Nothing. We literally could just go and take like a 90 second clip of him from a previous show or a rehearsal. And uh, and that's all we needed to make it sound just like him. It's really crazy. And then there's like places where you put in like sample dialogue, like, you know, some of the Victorian language of like, here's the kind of stuff he might say. Um, but it's it's amazing how easy it is. And by the way, you don't have to be in Unreal Engine for this. Like you go to the 11 Labs website or in World AI and you can just start to play with this stuff. It's really remarkable. And I, I can't believe that we're still so early into this to imagine where this will be in another year or five years is is really quite remarkable. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's I, a lot of. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, I was just gonna uh, agree. Please, I'm sure you have more interesting thoughts than whatever I was going to say. Um, no, I, I, yeah, I just want to continue adding on what Alex already mentioned. So there's a lot of fun stuff with training the brain, <laughs> training AI Dickens's brain, and I think Kevin would probably be the best person to, to like share his experience up with this. But one very interesting challenge is how to train AI Dickens to not lie. <laughs> <laughs> there is an interesting thing that uh, when we asked, like, uh, when is the next show? And I think this will just start to give random answers, like, oh, right. I know, it's today, <laughs> it's this 8 p.m. And then he will apologize, oh, sorry, I was mistaken, it was not right. It's actually tomorrow, 7 p.m. <laughs> and none <laughs> of that is true. <laughs> yeah, there's so also a weird thing. He, he... Wait, wait, wait. I... Yeah, go ahead. Just uh, I... how did you get yeah. around that after all? Yeah, sorry. I found that, uh, well, I guess, <laughs> so Kevin is the person actually solved this issue, but I think uh, he just like point a very clear direction of this kind of uh, questions, because I think before that we didn't give any um, information or any direction for him to go. So he just kind of go randomly, because <laughs> today is tomorrow. But now he always say that, oh, I don't know the correct answer, but you can check on uh, Agile Lens website, or you can uh, talk to Agile Lens team and they will give you the, uh, like the time or something. So I think it's uh, when, when you don't give it any direction, it will just go crazy and go randomly, go creative. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but you just need to point at a direction. <laughs> It's fun when he very confidently tells you something incorrect yeah. um, or is like, oh, uh, I hear the ghost of Christmas past is coming. Would you like to meet them? And I'll be like, <laughs> yes. And I'll be like, oh, oh, they're here. They're here right now. And you're like, there's no one there. And he'll be like, <laughs> oh, the ghost of Christmas past. I'm the ghost of Christmas past. And he'll like change his voice. And you'll be like, why are you doing this? We never gave you any instructions to ever do something like this. It's, it's look. 
look, man, it's, uh, you know, AGI, we're there. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it wants to lie to you all the time. Man. Cool. So, um, June, should we say anything else about the development or should we dive right into, you know, what it looks like and all that? Oh, I, I do also want to mention that this mm. year we got a lot of a lot more uh, helps and developers into yes. this project. Uh, <laughs> it makes it, I think it overall boosts the quality a lot and also makes um, it even more complicated <laughs> to, to just Boy, yeah, the process sense. of development is is a lot more complicated this year. But overall, I think it, it has been great. Yeah, because yeah, the first couple. Was... Oh, go ahead, Jack, Jacob. I was just gonna say, what what was like the technical accomplishment you were most excited about or or, or proudest of a, after this year? Well, I I think that the, um. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say that it doesn't crash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, the stability is <laughs> the next level. I mean, like last last year we have like one or two crash per show, and the the year before we have three or four crash per show so so this year we have zero crash per show is is already amazing i, I think every aspect has its um i think this year's uh, light and the transition is is totally um on a different level <laughs> compared to the last couple of years um definitely because we have more people like dante uh, they made a great job uh, making the levels and all the smooth transition like it's it's now fade in, not just jump in. <laughs> that is, for me, very. It feels very different to have that kind of like detailed touch on the transitions. Um, and also, I think that the, the control of the avatar and with uh, now we are finally able to let Ari be in the world and perform <laughs> with his own face, not just like because Ari has been requesting it for a couple of years. He always wants to interact with the people in the world. Um, real real time and actually be able to, to have the eye contact with players. Um, and this year, this is finally true. Yeah. Yeah. For a performer, it can be very weird to be like, I know I'm surrounded by virtual people, but all I'm looking at is a weird meshed version of my face. And in Ari's case, the best we could do is like, we'll buy you some 32 inch TVs to like put around your room and you'll have like some general idea of what direction everyone's in. But he was alone doing live link face with people floating around him. And so, you know, last year, at least we were able to give him someone to talk to. So Debbie was a part of it uh, as um, the ghosts. Um, but even that, it was still a live link face, still kind of detached. And we were still having a lot of pre-recorded elements, especially because we had very little time to set everything up last year. And the development team was super small. It was like June, myself, Rob Lester, you know, a couple other people who came in for a moment, but it was, it was small. Um, and so we were leaning a lot on things that were pre-recorded pre-recorded mocap data for the bodies. Debbie was only controlling the face. There were even scenes that were just technically complex enough that we would just trigger a sequence to make that happen. Um, so yeah, so this year for the entire thing to be live, nothing is pre-recorded. Debbie and Ari can see each other. They can see the audience. They can interact with them. Um, June and the team put together this great system where at any moment the audience can like send messages um, to everyone. We did discuss at one point, because we're all kind of ghosts as the audience members, that it would be a Ouija board, which is fun. But imagine what a nightmare that would be for like every single message you want to send, like one letter, two letter, three letter. <laughs> so there is just like a keyboard in VR and of course your regular keyboard if you're in desktop mode that you can send messages that everyone else can see. Um, we were really worried about content moderation, but luckily there haven't really been any trolls or you know bad folks yet. <laughs> That's good. It, it, was that a real concern going into this year uh just given that you were on the marketplace or because i i don't know if, if we ever shared the conclusion to that saga because <laughs> uh, at one point you were talking about hey maybe it will get approved for epic uh games marketplace maybe it won't do you want do you want to share more about that yeah I'll, I'll catch us up a little bit then i'll have june kind of bring us to the finish line but um we uh definitely you know for those who don't remember what we talked about in previous podcasts we did submit you know basic stuff to the marketplace uh early on just to see like hey what's the process look like um how do we get through all this we we talked a lot with rob lester who i mentioned worked with us before because he has um an experience that's also made it through the whole marketplace 
And uh, we realized a little bit late in the process that if we wanted to be able to distribute like a, a key, for example, and say, hey, anyone who's going to join the show, you know, buy your ticket and you'll get this key. And then you can go to the Epic Game Store and download it. But that was actually really complicated. Like we needed to get everyone's Epic ID, which is, of course, a long string of numbers. And that was just going to be so much friction that by the time the show started, we were like, it's going to be a lot easier just to do a Google Drive link. The problem with that, of course, is that, you know, it's a few gigabytes. It's not like 20 gigabytes like it was in previous years. But for anyone who doesn't have the fastest Internet connection to say, oh, hey, the show's about to start. Ooh, you didn't update to the latest build. Go to Google Drive and download it. We feel bad about that. So the reason we wanted to get on the Epic Game Store and Steam was because of the ability to patch it, you know, and be able to have it um, only update what needed to be patched and not do the whole thing over again. Uh, June and the team did put together a nice little system that is checking, that's always telling people whether or not they have the latest build, but it did feel like we weren't going to have a way to do this um, in the Epic Game Store until, I'll hand it off to June and say, what what happened? <laughs> Until when? When was it? Last Friday? Like a week ago? Yeah. Not yeah, long. like last Friday. <laughs> basically, basically, like two weeks after we start the show, um, uh, we finally passed the check. <laughs> so we are finally in the live stage and finally able to publish uh, our build. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just share my screen just so everyone can kind of see what it looks like um, in the store. Because what again, we thought we were going to be trying to like distribute keys and do this whole private thing. Um, but it turned out that Epic was actually much more supportive of this than um, I think we were anticipating. So if you guys can see my screen right now. Um, so here's like the dev branch of when we were trying to get everything set up. And it was just, you know, very specific users like June and myself and a few others who could access it. Um, but then once we had everything approved for like this private dev level where everyone could have individual keys, we realized it was actually very easy to then just go and publish it. And whoops, it's actually launching and uh, making it available for everyone. Uh, let me try to come back to where it was. It's so yeah, easy that, now. It, it launches so easy. Screenshot of you on the front of the the page from three years ago. Why, why? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, that's very old. So... The the yeah. Agilent <laughs> the Agilent's YouTube channel where we're broadcasting all this is uh, mostly just a couple unboxing videos of me from a long time ago. Um, <laughs> yes, Charles Dickens. I hear you. Got like the whole project running right now. Okay, I just want to go to the store. Go to store page. Cool. Um, right. So here's the store page. It's public. Anyone can search for this and find it in the Epic Game Store. Um, we did have to do some finagling with like how the release date worked and all that. Um, but to Epic Games' credit, like no chance this is going to be on Steam. Like we tried to go through that process and it was super complicated. When we submitted this to Epic, um, they were very thoughtful. Like we were nervous about like, does Epic want like a cut of the ticket sales and all that? They actually commented on it like, hey, it looks like there's a page people need to go to to purchase tickets. And we thought, oh, this is the part where they say like they need a 30% cut. They were like, we would recommend that you have a little box in here that says like, here's where you can go to buy tickets. So so like they, they actually were trying to make it easier to create like a little HTML where, you know, you go to the page to do all this stuff, uh, which was very cool. And um, there were probably we were worried about like the AI. Tim Sweeney had already said, like, we don't care. It's totally fine. I and I also like the fact that when we first submitted this, their response was like, hey, it's it's a live show. Like, how do we access this? How do we make sure this is approved? And I just decided to say, like, yeah, it's a live show. You could come to the live show or I'm going to give you some instructions on how to pretend you're a stage manager and cycle through all the cues. And here's the script of what the actors are going to say. And like a day later, they're like, cool, thumbs up, approved, which nice. I didn't actually expect. So that was very cool. So there was an actual human that that actually had emotions and, and read what you sent them is what you're saying. Yeah. Nice. That was cool. Um, I also want to give a shout out to June, who solved the weirdest problem, which was when we finally did get on the Epic Game Store, uh, we found that if you just launched it directly from the Epic Game Store, our whole multiplayer system wasn't working. We couldn't send cues or anything. And so then it's like, oh, so now we're telling people like, OK, you can download it from Google Drive or you can download it from the Epic Game Store. But if you do not download it from the Epic Game Store, you need to find where the actual build is and then click on the EXE or one of our batch files. And like that was additional friction. Um, but yeah, June, what did we learn about what happens when you launch directly from the Epic Game Store? Yeah, right. So that was actually uh, a simple problem, but I just didn't realize that it has that. Uh, so if we launch from Epic Game Store, it actually adds on some um, just additional launch parameter. 
it will start with like checking if you are um, logged in and if you have your app ID and et cetera. And because we, um, in our game, we also use launch parameter to trigger several things like the, uh, like the server IP, like the, um, the server port or the OSC port, those kind of things. So my, <laughs> because I didn't expect that a launch from Epic Game Store will add those launch parameters. So I only said that if the launch parameter is none, we'll have like the default set of uh, launch parameters. And then, or if the launch parameter is something else, then I will specify this and this and this. Uh, but because uh, Epic Game Store add their own launch parameter, so it is either none and, and it's not uh, my launch parameter. So it's just mess up with our IP, our OSC port and system. Uh, so noticing that uh, I just have to remember to um, to make the, the launch parameter still true if we launch from Epic Game Store. Gotcha. That makes sense. That makes sense. Because if you ever look at like the shortcuts that they install mm -hmm. on like your desktop, there's a, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in there. But do, yeah. do they make you use like, like are, does Epic Games have like requirements against things like, or uh, uh, about like having anti-cheat or like any sort of wrapper, did they make you change your executable in any way to, to upload it? No, I don't think so. I think it's pretty flexible. And also I tried to, to upload some batch files and I was thinking maybe they will block the batch file yeah. or like maybe they will block. Uh, oh, and also we have like an additional <laughs> exe inside um, because we use like uh, some Node.js stuff made from yeah. A10. And, <laughs> With another colleague, Marshall, who and they, they uh, just let that yeah. fly. There's they, like, they just let it. Just we are, no we are file to launch. Yeah, we're even like launch the like an additional batch file to launch an additional <laughs> Node.js exe from inside the game, and and everything just upload and just there. <laughs> I that's surprising, honestly. I I, I would have yeah. thought they'd have some pretty crazy scanners. Uh, yeah, they would. Content, but hey. Yeah, surprisingly free. <laughs> Cool. They, maybe they looked at like the age of your account and stuff like like how old was this account <laughs> alex that, <laughs> that everything was uploaded to this that had to factor into this yeah um so just to keep chugging along here um do you not know if you have the uh the editor pulled up but i thought we could just show very briefly yeah, what the project looks it. like you know especially i know a lot of people who watch the podcast uh they are, you know, getting started with Unreal Engine development. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people assume that all Unreal Engine projects from professionals, I guess we're technically professionals, are like super well organized. Everything's very, very clean. And to be fair, we did clean up this project significantly from what it looked like uh, last year and the year before. We did like a big GitHub migration. But um, just to give a little sense of, you know, what this looks like, just to zoom out a little bit, is there's some things that like only the actors can see that just helps them like position themselves. There's some things only the audience or the crew can see. There's all these different levels um, that get turned on and off. So we're not using world partition or anything like that. Let me just toggle like a bunch of these on. Um, and we've got a whole queue system that Josie masterminded for putting together um, how we like move from one spot to another. And then we also uh, started to play with a lot of things that only turn on and off like at different quality levels. A big change this year is this is the first time where we actually let people download the experience locally. Um, whereas in the past we did everything through pixel streaming and cloud XR. So it's like, we're gonna put everyone on RTX A6000s. Whereas now it's like, okay, what if someone downloads this and they only have a GTX 1070? Like, can we get the quality settings to where they need to be? By the way, uh, there is a benchmark system in Unreal that we had very high hopes for because it runs like a benchmark test to figure out how um, powerful your computer is. I think we've got this in our uh, persistent level here. And what I learned actually very recently was that the benchmark test, here's a, a fun look at our, our spaghetti code and our persistent level. The oh. benchmark test that runs here, it's called Run Hardware Benchmark. It's actually a very old node that goes back to like a mid version of Unreal Engine 4. And so it's not actually looking at what's in your scene. It just does like a test to like give a, a score to your CPU and GPU. And uh, the work scale is kind of like the precision level. And then the score is really based on what the state of GPU and CPU hardware was back in like 
2015 or something <laughs> like that. And so it thinks that everyone should be running Epic settings because that's, you know, all the, all the graphics cards everyone has now are so much better. So, you know, in theory, this is great. It's like run hardware benchmark, apply the benchmark results, et cetera. And then, you know, here's the results everyone's in, here's the scalability, but it actually does end up being uh, more complicated than that. Um, June, as long as I've got the editor pulled up, anything I should navigate to briefly? Well, I, I know something you should navigate to, which yeah. is the, the settings for the project. To talk <laughs> about what what you included here for your rendering settings, you know, what were the plugins you used? Oh, sure. Let's let's give the people the, the real dirt here, you know? Yeah, so we are using uh, deferred rendering, not forward. A lot of people assume that anytime you're doing a VR project, you want to use forward. It is faster, but if you have a lot of lights, if you have metahumans, metahumans do not, not look good in forward rendering, so we're on deferred. Um, we were off instance stereo for a while because we were getting some weird artifacts. Uh, we did turn it back on, gives you a nice performance boost. Things are not looking weird anymore, so that's fine. Um, anything else, June, in here before I jump over to some of the plugins we've got on? Nice. That's about Lumen them. Nanite. Those disabled, enabled. Yeah, so we Me. do have Lumen and Nanite. Um, mm -hmm. We are turning off the post processing and global illumination settings though, because it's caused some weird artifacts with the baked lighting. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to get to 5.3 was for instance stereo with Lumen and Nanite. Didn't quite make it there. We did get it working in 5.3, but then uh, there were some other things that we still needed to get working back in 5.2. Still happy to be in 5.2. Um, one thing I like to point out to people for anti-aliasing is that if you're using something like DLSS or the um, the AMD equivalent, which I always forget the name of, which we also have in here, um, you need to make sure that you're not using temporal super resolution because those are all basically competing with each other. You can either use TSR or DLSS or something else. And so if you're going to use one of those other ones, you can either have anti-aliasing set to none or temporal anti-aliasing, which can still contribute to um, the other settings. That's something I like to call out to people. Most times when I see people using DLSS, they still have that set uh, to TSR. So some of the plugins we have active include, let's see, installed um, some basic ones. Uh, here we go, Fidelity FX. So that's a DLSS alternative. So we're not sure if it's working properly because we don't know anyone that doesn't have a, an RTX card of some kind, but we do have a switch that checks to see is DLSS supported? And if not, it will use the AMD Fidelity FX Super Resolution. Uh, we have the Meta XR plugin enabled, which we need for face tracking and eye tracking. That was giving us a bunch of headaches with SteamVR not working. We had the MetaHuman plugin enabled for some of the MetaHuman animator stuff we were doing. But then once that's all processed, that can be disabled. Uh, here's the DLSS stuff. Frame generation, not actually supported by VR. Maybe it works in the 2D version. I'm not sure. June, I don't know if you know. <laughs> Not we got, yeah, yeah, we got, we have Rococo. Um, also worth noting that that June and the team put together a really good, we call it emergency mode. So if Rococo goes down because it's a very fragile motion capture suit, um, Ari at any given moment can switch back over into, you know, IK with uh, the controllers and the head and all that. We've been waiting for a long time for Meta to update the movement SDK. Uh, they haven't. So, you know, June has painstakingly <laughs> built a lot of that stuff um, from scratch. Uh, the Victory BP library is a very common plugin that a lot of people use for things like, you know, IP addresses and all sorts of other little things. Uh, Vive OpenXR, June recently enabled to see if that would help us with Steam VR things. Um, uh, Runtime data yep. table. Yeah, we use that to just grab information from uh, Google Sheet uh, so we can update our, our uh, next show uh, to the countdown, countdown clock of our next show and also the latest version of the current field. That's yeah. pretty interesting. Wait, wait, wait. So so what information is coming from Google Sheets? <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. We just that, use that. that. <laughs> you, you, you're like your database is Google Sheets and you're pulling yeah. from oh, that's insane. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So so what's in Google Sheets? You, we have I'm, not, oh, I, I'm yeah, sorry, we, you can't we can get away show with that. One, I, <laughs> yeah, um I I might have the web link handy. Yeah, do you have the web link? I can so that's pretty yeah, cool. And, and this this is another mm -hmm. thing that we first did another project. One of the first projects <laughs> June and I worked with was a VR training thing. And um, we actually had a connection to Google Sheets that would like take data from people answering like multiple choice questions and uh getting everything that way. Oh, um, what's like the a nice new... survey system, huh? That's yeah. Cool. Um, June, what's the name of that file? I just want to... Uh, it's 2023 Showtime. Oh, no, ACC VR Showtimes. ACC VR Showtimes. There we go. Yeah. 
So it looks like this. Here you go, hackers. If you want to <laughs> get into this file, you can screw up all sorts of fun things. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's basically just, oh, and also uh, Marshall is still the person who made the system. But we first started to use the, AC, uh, the, the data something runtime plugin when we were doing uh, Four Seasons. Uh, we allow the host to put in um, every client's name and then send it to um, put the name in Google, what is it, Google Form, and then it will like a document in um, Google Sheet and we grab the data from Google Sheet. And before we use this plugin, I think a, a thing that worth uh, mentioning is that before that, uh, Marshall was was using the uh, the default plugin. I think it's like HTTP oh, something. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the the Unreal official plugin. But if we use that plugin, it will always crash our build. I think. Oh yeah, I've, I've, I've used this one. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, HTTP blueprint. Yeah, that is going to crash the build. <laughs> So don't use that. Yeah, fun mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and so what you're seeing in that Google Sheet, so down here in the lobby, by the way, great vertex animated people from uh, Dante. Good job, Dante. Before we actually had more metahumans, which was kind of heavy. This is uh, simpler and cooler. Um, so if I turn off some of the things in here, boop, 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 boop. oh, I forgot that it's like manual visibility, hide selected. Uh, let's turn back on the Dickens house. Um, so everything you're seeing in that Google Sheet, we access for uh, the show times, which is in a couple spots like here. So this says when the next show is going to be. Um, there's another one over there. And then there's a, a thing up here that accesses the version um, in the Google Sheet, com compares it against the version you have, and will tell you if you need to update. Thankfully, in the Epic Games Launcher, it does it automatically. But for anyone who is downloading from Google Drive, it will tell them if they don't have the latest build. That's pretty fascinating. I, I got to say, so like this versus, especially for, for this use case, where it's, it's stuff that you're going to be manually editing a lot. You're not going to necessarily, it doesn't make necessarily sense to build a UI around this, right? To not have to deal with a, a, a normal database and just use a spreadsheet. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> like uh, that's, that's pretty cool. I, 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 you know, the, 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 the programmer in me, you know, uh, hates it but the 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 logic part of me loves it so i i i can appreciate it yeah there's so many hoops that we've jumped through to like not have to deal with aws and like dedicated servers and all these traditional yeah. things that people would have <laughs> firebase and and whatnot um so you know anytime we can just be like oh a google doc cool what's the link here you go um we get pretty happy about that yeah. well we also have a nice corner here by the way it's not quite an easter egg but some of the other agile lens um theater projects over there um re tar in the first year had set up some cool little um plaques of uh some of the vr technology that was around when charles dickens was around like wonderscopes and stereoscopes and uh, these are actual um i forget the term for these slides that would be projected. magic lanterns magic slide. lantern thank you so much jacob perfect so those are all in here and we also did, oh, June, why don't you talk briefly about what our, our ticket check was? <laughs> yeah, so we had a we had a meeting about uh, how are we going to do the ticket check? How are we going to really screen and filter out the people that actually have a ticket? So originally, I think we want to make it a uh, DLC. A DLC for the Epic Games Store, yeah. But I'm sure it's too complicated. <laughs> and at the time we want to actually make a ticket, it's already too late for us to start to learn how to make DLC and how to make it work. So um, so basically at the end, we decided that um, we are, and because uh, at first we wanted to make it so that when, when people download, they only download the lobby and they need to buy a ticket to download the full version. But, uh, but then we start to worry, what if people are just, decided to buy the ticket the last minute and they need to spend another 20 minutes to download the whole build. So we decided that we just want to have the full build just be there and we want people to solve a puzzle to get their ticket. So we actually make it a little escape room game in there. We just hide our key in one of the book in, in the <laughs> bookshelf. And if they um so if they buy the ticket, we will send them in an instruction of how to get your key. Your key is actually hidden in that book in the second shelf or, or some shelf. And, it, and you have to grab your key and 
um, bring the key to a hidden door, and then you will be in the official pre-show lobby. And we also think that if people, if someone just um, did the effort to flip all the books and find the key, maybe <laughs> they just deserve to see the show. Yeah, they shouldn't have to pay. They worked hard. I, I thought for sure you were going to say it was a Google Sheet. I, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I, I thought for sure you're going to be like, yeah, we, we, you know, we, we just make up passwords in a Google Sheet and just send them out. <laughs> like, I thought for sure. Oh, we but did no, also have cool. a password to yeah. bypass everything. <laughs> that's fair. No, no, that, that's that's pretty fun. Well, you're, you're kind of leaking this, though. We got to make sure this doesn't come out uh, until <laughs> after the, the last show, right? When is the last show? Well, we have a 7 p.m. show Eastern Standard Time tomorrow, then a 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time show Saturday, and then Sunday will be an all day long uh, pre-recorded live stream. So that's Christmas Eve, of course. So we'll have you know selections of our favorite uh, streams. Maybe there will be a little bonus Easter egg in there of something from years past. And uh, yeah, we hope a lot of people come. We did decide to make the tickets free for the final two shows because we went with a season pass model with the idea being we wanted people to support kind of the development, almost like an early access thing for how the show would evolve over the course of December. Um, but now that the show's kind of reached its final form, I say that knowing that June and I are still adding a bunch of things to the GitHub in prep for tomorrow, uh, we thought we just want as many people to see this as possible. And it's a nice kind of Christmas present to the world for everyone to see everyone's hard work. Um, so yeah, we hope everyone comes and checks it out. Um, I also thought I could show a little bit of what this looks like when you first come in. Um, so June, why don't you narrate us through this a little bit and I'll just kind of do it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So the first thing that happened in front of you would be uh, to say your own name. So, yeah, like that. And then you will see the on the ESO is the instruction and welcome menu. And on the left hand side is the uh, little mirror like thing that will be the look of your avatar. Uh, and it will be the same thing other people see you. Uh, there are different uh, colors and <laughs> yeah, you can send out a message. It will be like a little message box in front of you. Uh, and when you're saying something, you will be uh, bright yellow, just so everyone else know you're saying something. Um, yeah, and on, on the left, ESO is the instruction, instruction of the non-VR uh, users. But if you join in VR, that will be the VR instruction. Mm, also, I think... Uh, so if you are a non-ticketed user, I think this build is running on a uh, a crew rehearsal batch file. So the deacons didn't say anything. Oh, he did but actually. You... No, yeah, oh, he, was, he, he was a little loud. So I here, let me do a quick, uh, here's a fun shortcut. Restart level will uh, actually restart your game. And we do have this in a, a development build, not a shipping build. So anyone who <laughs> actually wants to go enter a bunch of CVARs, you're more than welcome to. So here he is. Yeah, so yeah, we have this welcome um, pre recorded Dickens. Uh, he's going to intro do a short introduction of this sh show and will encourage you to buy the ticket. <laughs> yeah, and this is done when uh, done by Ari and uh, through MetaHuman Animator, I believe. Yeah. yeah. After he finished the talk, he, uh, his head it will actually continue to track you. <laughs> just look at just you. A little, just a little creepy. Just a little know, bit. Good to know he's watching. So here's the information about the next show um, over there. And then, you know, because we're pretty much letting everyone come into these final two shows. So the escape room thing we mentioned is we tell people to come up, open the book here. You can open the other books as well if you want to. You know, nothing in there. But here's the key, you grab the key, comes over to you, and then, oh look, a door has appeared with the Marley knocker. And so you go over and you have a pudding in his mouth, and then it brings you into the actual uh, pre-show lobby, and then you're ready for the actual show. So congratulations, you're in the official pre-show lobby. Very cool. And, and then, so the, uh, yeah, go talk ahead, Talk to AI Dink uh, Dickens, do you just like, Ooh, June, can you cue that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so June has a, a host build happen. going so she can actually make things happen. And we'll definitely want to do a screen share where we can also show what some of the behind the scenes stuff looks like yeah. as well. Okay, so first one, um, 
Okay, the next one is going to show AI Dickens. I wonder if he can hear me. Oh, yes, he can. <laughs> of course, my dear. <laughs> Charles, do you know what podcasts are? I'll read his line so people can hear it. Yes, ah, ma'am. yes, I am familiar with the with podcasts. I'm glad to hear that, my dear. I'm glad to hear that, my dear. Is there a particular podcast you would like to discuss, or perhaps a topic you would like to explore? No, that's all for now, Charles. We got a lot to cover tonight. Of course, of course, my dear. I understand. Well, I will be here when you are ready. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me if you need any assistance. Goodbye. Have a wonderful evening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your performance. Of the performance. Yeah. Um, and so these other little lens flares you see floating around, these are other people inside the multiplayer experience right now. Normally, One I would of see it is me. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, so that's I, yeah. There we go. Crew. There's me. the crew. Yeah. And I can talk to you. Oh, right. Yeah. Let's see the crew say something. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. I am yes. scared. Oops. <laughs> yeah. So you send out your little messages. Scared. Cool. Okay, and then um, if the show was now about to start, um, can we show a little bit, even though we don't have Ari here, a little bit what it would look like when Ari enters the uh, the household here, the Dickens house lobby? Yeah, let uh, me just trigger the next queue. And um, well, we cannot move Dickens there, but we can show Scooch. Yeah. And so this might be a cool moment to maybe if June, if you want to share um, your oh, screen yeah, once you have like Rococo up and running. Yeah. So I, I'm obviously doing everything the way like an audience member would see it. Um, but let's see a little bit behind the scenes. For those who are audio listeners, I all I've <laughs> seen so far is Scrooge T posing next to a podium. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I got to see where this goes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, oh, I. I need to upgrade my plan. <laughs> you have to upgrade Rococo. your plan. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Um, well, yeah, well, how about we try something else? And, uh, yeah, well, June, should, while I, should I, I update my plan? Should I show a little mm -hmm. bit of the camera system for a moment? Oh, yeah, that would be great. So gra throw a ghost in here, too, and I'll show a little bit about how we're trying to do the live stream this year. Uh, let me transition everyone to London so we have more right. space. There we go. And so I will show the ghost. Okay, so all three characters are in the scene. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so we got a, a Marley, a Dickens, and a Scrooge. And so uh, the camera system is something I started to work on last year, but really just ran out of time for it because I always feel bad when people are like, oh, I'd love to see the show. I don't have a VR headset. I don't feel comfortable with pixel screaming or, you know, any of the interactive things. And, you know, even for just like my mom, like I want to make it easy for them to watch the show. So we wanted to set up an easy way to jump to different cameras. And here's a fun thing. Even though we do have a specific set of launch parameters for Carlos Austin, who's editing everything on the fly, um, anyone, if they hit the caps locks key, uh, even just in your regular show, this will put you in a camera mode where the number keys one through nine, and then also zero, as well as RTY will jump you to different camera angles. So if I press the one key, we'll get uh, this wide shot of Scrooge. Uh, the equivalent would be six, which would be kind of the wide shot of our ghost, um, two, is a little bit closer, right? And then three becomes kind of an interesting over the shoulder shot. So we're doing all this based on bones and like where bone locations are and jumping to different locations. Oh, there we go. We got a little bit of so a So th this all changes as the scene progresses. Exactly. So it's it's finding the different bone locations and then doing everything relative to their bones. Um, and if at any given moment you wanna do like a clean back and forth, if you press the space bar, it'll do kind of like a, a clean swap. So same thing over here, if I'm in like the wide shot over here. So, you know, equivalent, equivalent, oh, wow. equivalent, equivalent. Um, and then if I want to do, you know, stuff with Dickens, 
then I've got him over here as well with RTY. So this is meant to make it much easier for our live streaming team to get good shots. Um, we also have uh, key five, which is kind of just like a nice rotating aerial um, and control and shift will actually lock the cameras in certain locations. Oh, here we go, Rococo. Yeah. So we got some Rococo data streaming through. Um, lovely. Definitely not Ari's performance. Um, and uh, the VCAM stuff is cool. So VCAM, for those who don't know, is something that runs uh, typically for, you know, virtual production shoots. It's a way to take like a phone and then treat it as an actual uh, camera. And it only runs in the editor. So next to me, I have a laptop that is running the editor and has VCAM open. And then over here on my other phone, I can pixel stream into that computer. Um, and Jackie, who operates the VCAM during the show, we actually set up the VPN. Jacob and I had a big VPN discussion a couple of weeks ago. And so Jackie is able to VPN into my local network. So when she opens the uh, LiveLink VCAM app, um, it thinks that she's on my network and she can very easily um, connect to it. So right now, if I move the camera around here, I am actually, you know, just like walking through the space. So this is using AR to kind of move. And at any given moment, if someone watching the show were to press the zero key, that actually gives them kind of a dampened view of whatever I'm doing, or usually Jackie is doing with the VCAM, which is kind of cool. So if she's, you know, moving up and trying to get like a nice close up of Scrooge or whatever, um, doing this in kind of a, a touch screen way. So, you know, I'm trying to get a nice shot of Scrooge and I'm right here, and then the camera is gonna, you know, make its way over to there as well. So it's just kind of cool that this is something that is designed for the live stream team, uh, but anyone can be doing this as well. So this is meant to make our, our YouTube streams much more dynamic than uh, they typically would be. Any questions on that, Jacob? I, I mean, I think that's really cool. Like how, how long, or let, let, let me say this. What do you think the advantages were from, uh, the perspective of of the people putting on the show of of having a, a more curated view here because you know you have all the keys like are you worried that they're gonna miss a moment do you feel like this is uh like and do you have any information about like what sort of views people were using the most do you have an intuition maybe on, on what sort of views people were using the most well, whenever someone goes to one of these views, their pawn is actually being moved. We're not jumping them to cameras. We are putting their pawn there. So we can actually see if people are using these views by noting like, oh, hey, someone's in camera five because they're rotating around the scene. Um, we're also gonna have scale. So you'll also get a sense of how people are, you know, changing different scales a little bit as the show goes on. Um, yeah, that's all a very fun way, I think, to experience a show. Also, if you don't like, there's times where you got to cover some ground and if Ari's like this way, everyone, and you got to go for a walk. And if you're not the kind of person who wants to use WASD or an Xbox controller, just knowing that at any given moment, you can like snap right over to, you know, where Scrooge is or something, uh, is definitely handy. So as you can see here, even though Scrooge is moving around, we're getting, um, kind of this dampened view that moves with him. Um, but for our live stream, we'll typically, you know, freeze the camera and try to get a shot there. And then when we need a different shot, then we'll jump over to, you know, a new location. Oh, and here's a cool way we're using pixel streaming this year. So um, June and I set it up so that there are all of these cameras actually running on CoreWeave um, in the cloud. So Carlos and everyone else actually is able to see what all of these procedural cameras are seeing at any given moment as kind of a video village. So then Carlos has kind of a view of all of those. And then he knows, oh, hey, if I cut to this view of you know Dickens right now, I know what it's gonna look like. I think it's gonna be a good That's shot. Cool. And he's not just kind of guessing like, oh, maybe the shot will be good. Maybe it won't be, et cetera, et cetera. How good was the synchronization there? Given that you're kind of sending these cues, um, you know, separately to each client. Good. I think, I don't think anyone's felt like they've been lagging or the latency has been perceivable, right, Jim? Yeah, that's pretty real time. Yeah. The, the only problem is the uh, internet. Right. I think. <laughs> yeah, a that's lot of people, a lot of people think <laughs> they have more stable internet than they do when really it's like a lot of spikes and dropped signals and that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, June, do you have a, a good backstage view to share? Yeah, um, let me share my screen. If I can this. optimize. Oh, there we go, yeah. There, yeah. <laughs> On the right hand side here, this is the host 
dude, but um, we actually make it just the same as a client dude, um, more because it's easier for uh, debugging. <laughs> so, so we just need like one host view to, uh, to check everything is working. So in host here, we actually is able to see like how many client audiences we have right now. And yeah, and we, we are also counting like how many non-VR player has joined and how many VR player has joined. And on the left hand uh, left side here is our crew build, which is the stage manager build. So we know that we are currently in, um, say, the queue number three. Uh, so if I hit spacebar, I can load the next queue and hit it again, it will trigger it. And I, I can do some like emergency control things like I can hide Dickens. So you can see that for the general, uh, for, for audiences, Dickens is hidden, but for the crew, we can still see where Dickens is and it will just have like a big sign saying hidden. <laughs> I personally like the big red button on your screen that says show is finished. Kick everyone. Yeah. Out. That's a good, <laughs> and, and even better when it says RE emergency. Uh, please, yeah. you got to give me some, some backstory there. Yeah, so our emergency is um, is going to be hit once uh, Rococo is done. So when uh, because Rococo just guy just likes to randomly uh, lose an arm or lose a leg or <laughs> just randomly <laughs> likes to crash. So when that happens, uh, we will hit our emergency and we will uh, change to use um, the IK control. So we will just go back to uh, controller and hit that <laughs> and. <laughs> So yeah, but we can swap between emergency and non-emergency. Nice. You also can um, see, Jacob, that we, uh, we're we very concerned about trolls. And so we have like yeah. blocking IP addresses and all sorts of stuff. Like just in case someone's trying to ruin yeah. the show, we have something we can do. <laughs> like now you, I just you... blocked Alex. Oh no, oh, nice. oh June. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. So like the moderation stuff is, is definitely very cool and, and not the kind of thing you would get out of a normal multiplayer system, I, I would guess. Yeah, we probably will be able to uh, have it on the normal multiplayer system, but I guess it will be have to uh, go through the same like hands on modification uh, right. to build the system. Yeah, that's very yeah. cool. Things like uh, we have the emergency control to make Dickens back to stage center <laughs> or Davy back to stage center. Yeah, because in, in both VR and in a Rococo suit, you do often have to deal with drift where like the performer hasn't moved, but their body just starts to go to the wrong place. And the show mm -hmm. is blocked, just like a real theater performance where it's like, you know, Ari starts here and he takes five steps forward and Debbie turns and they're facing each other. And uh, if they are too far off from that, it changes a lot of things, especially for things like our camera people who are counting on like, I really like the angle where you see Ari and then the door knocker and then all that kind of stuff happening all at the same time. Yeah. And last thing is we have different um, actor for Gabby and so I, I, I'm curious with, with Ari's system where you mentioned he's like going back and forth between multiple characters. How mm -hmm. are you doing that behind the scenes to yeah. like actually map his voice and motion so that it, it doesn't become jarring? Yeah, we are still actually still figuring out how to do the uh, spatial audio. So we actually uh, are just broadcasting uh, his audio in a non-special some spatial way. Uh, it's just like the general 2D audio for RV. Um, as for the animation, um, we have the thing. So actually, RV is, um, RV's pawn is the same pawn as everyone else's pawn. And we were just attaching his pawn to different uh, head location uh, on Dickens and on Scrooge or, or so on would, a third point of view. Would the character he's not part of just switch to IK? Is, is that, or like a oh. fixed animation? Yes, that's it. Oh, yeah, because we're <laughs> okay, not, none of us are in our review, so it's hard to show. But yeah, so uh, when when Ari is in Dickens, uh, Scrooge will be freeze to his last pose. Uh, okay. We have 
we have some discussion about like how uh, if we want to uh, make it fall back to an idle animation or we want it to fall back to just like freeze. And uh, because uh, I think at first we tried the idle animation, uh, but it's kind of weird that uh, when Scrooge is doing something and when he jumps back to Dickens, Scrooge will just uh, quickly <laughs> stand up and lurp yeah. into an idle animation. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, it's more because if we want to make it beautiful, it's too much work to <laughs> to do like 30 different idle animation. Jacob, so we are, just are you fall back to free, freeze. Yeah, Jacob, are you, are you familiar with the improv game called Freeze? No. So this used to be on things like Whose Line Is It Anyway? And everyone who's ever done improv in like college or whatever, there's a game where you're doing a scene and then um, usually two people and then someone else will yell freeze and both characters will freeze their position and then someone else will go and tap someone on the shoulder, assumes the same position. And now what was, uh, oh my God, you're going to kill me is like, now we're gonna go in for a big hug or something like that. So then you change the scene. So there's a little bit of that that Ari uses here because as he jumps back and forth between the characters, they will freeze in the last position that he left them in. And he'll do that for these you know, very tender moments sometimes where Dickens is pretending to be Belle and the hand is reaching out and Scrooge goes and like touches the hand. And so Ari has to set all of this up as he jumps between um, the different characters. Uh, June, should I try launching either as Debbie or Ari just to show a little bit what that looks like? Yeah, it would be fun. I, I think either will work. Uh, if you're going to jump in as Ari, I will stop the Rococo animation so you, so you will, gotcha. won't be yeah, let, me, let me try. <laughs> Although we can watch it free, freak out and fight for a second. <laughs> Hit the Ari emergency. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we one thing we do a lot of in Unreal Engine, which I wish I learned about a lot earlier, is using batch files. So if you've got a bunch of different variables and parameters in like your game instance, then you can have a batch file that calls on all of those and says like, you know, we are doing a rehearsal right now. So skip past like all the ticket checks. This person is going to be launching with these quality settings or as an actor or as a crew member. And so, you know, you can create a batch file just with a simple notepad kind of setup. And I think I did show a little bit of that stuff when we were talking about pixel streaming um, the other week, but it's a, a really useful way to make sure Unreal Engine is launching uh, a build exactly the way you want it to. Yeah, we can show it uh, briefly. It's a little secret. <laughs> so we just use things like uh, actor equals to true and use something to change the port and uh, specify that like, like this player will be client or host. And if this build is going to be already, <laughs> things like that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I set it to be the emergency mode. So now if you're jumping, you should be able to control the avatar with control groups. Okay. Um, I might be in a, a weird wonky build because it's not launching at the moment. Let me try. Oh, here it goes. Whoop, nope. No, it's not. <laughs> Let me try again. Launchy, launchy, launch. Oh, actually I can try to launch as Debbie. Yeah, go ahead. One fun thing too about our multiplayer system is we can have uh, multiple instances running on one computer. So I'm on, you know, a beefy RTX 4090, and I actually found I can have four instances of the game running at once. One of them in VR, three of them not in VR, and it's actually pretty smooth. And I can kind of just get a good bird's eye view of uh, a lot of the stuff happening that I would have assumed I would need to be using um, pixel streaming for, but not true. Yeah. Very cool. Oh, we have Josie in the chat. Josie wants to know, can I exclude things using a batch file? Well, that's just, I think so. Yeah, that's the same as like pick things to a batch file, right? Yeah, I think it's the same idea. I think what actually happened on my end is my air link broke. There's so many hoops we jump through for this stuff and it's so easy for like one thing to break. We had a like a weird thing where Ari put on the MetaQuest Pro and it was like, oh, his controllers aren't tracking now. He didn't do anything wrong. It just, you know, an update for Meta or some weird little firmware problem is suddenly just making it so the controllers don't work. So we also all... had a lot of fun with Steam VR. Yes, Steam VR has been a nightmare because we we know so many people, of course, who have a Valve Index or Vive or you know 
Um, I, I was testing with a Vario XR3 over here, um, which not many people have, but we want, of course, this to work on as many headsets as possible. And um, we were getting crashes and black screens. And it seemed like I, one thing we started to do a week ago was try to translate all the OSC face data, eye and, and uh, mouth tracking data, because that would actually allow us to disable the Meta XR plugin. Um, but then we had Wit on our team testing a build where we weren't asking him to test Steam VR. We just wanted to know if he was getting a DLSS crash, which was like a weird thing we were troubleshooting. And then he's like, oh no, the crash is gone. Everything's running fine in my valve index. And we're like, wait, what do you mean everything's running fine in your valve index? He's like, yeah, look, here's a screenshot. Everything's fine. And we're like, wait, so you are in Steam VR and it's working. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, what's what's the big deal? It's like, wait, we haven't gotten Steam VR to work yet. That's incredible news. So this week has been a lot of uh, trying to figure that out and make it consistent. <laughs> what's been the biggest challenge? I mean, you guys launched on a ton of platforms, <laughs> or, or, you know, uh, different devices, different ways of ac accessing it. What, what was the biggest pain or the biggest challenge and all that? Hmm. What do you think, June? Well, I think the biggest challenge is Sting VR. Yeah. <laughs> I think the different uh, headset is it's really making it challenging, like uh, just the fact that they have different buttons. And um, I still have pro we still have problem with like um, the, the VR controller binding on Sting VR. Um, but overall, um, I think it's fine. Uh, almost, I, I still think like uh, ninety percent of the things kind of just work because we're. Uh, I, I, oh, also because we're targeting only at PC VR, not like standalone VR. So we, in theory, we are just making one that exe, and that is like, executable uh, is able to handle everything, in yeah. theory. It's tricky because we have, obviously we love desktop VR and we want to be able to use Lumen and Nanite and all these incredible Unreal Engine features. But a lot of the people who have shown interest in the show have been like, oh, well, how can I just run it standalone? <laughs> nice job, June. Uh, for anyone who can't see, June is uh, acting as the ghost of Christmas past right now. And you can see some of the IK stuff. And uh, June, do we have face tracking there as well? Yes, but uh, I am very dark in the scene, so I'm going to change myself to. Yeah. We also smiling. have like a rehearsal light. We can turn on a light just to make it easier for everyone to see everything. Oh, um, no, we, we kind of uh, kind of closed it actually. Yeah. Oh, we, we did. Oh, did we now. disable it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just... So here's June coming up to the camera as Marley and is waving at us. Our audio here. Yeah. And um, yeah, so this is, you know, it, it's like it, this kind of stuff, so much of the stuff is out of the box for like our friends at, you know, Ferryman Collective who do a lot of live VR theater in things like VR chat. There's all this stuff that comes out of the box when you're using an existing platform. And we have ended up painstakingly building a lot of this from scratch uh, for Unreal Engine because those tools don't really exist yet. So I'm very, very proud of June and the whole team for everything they've accomplished. And I should also mention like no investors, like no one's come on board and been like, I wanna give you guys a million dollars to make this happen. So we're really doing this uh, in a bootstrappy kind of way, uh, certainly hoping that it leads to, to more projects and bigger projects, but it's absolutely been a labor of love so far. Yeah. I mean, it, it shows and, and every year it's gotten better. Yeah. Um, in June, I, for some reason, just can't launch uh, AirLink right now. That's a thing that happens. Um, do you want to try relaunching as Ari just to show a little bit of what it looks like to jump back and forth? Oh, yeah, sure. Cool. Yeah. It's good to have multiple headsets for testing. Like, you know, I mentioned the Vario XR3, Quest Pro, Quest 3. Uh, I got a Vive in the other room. We've got a, a Vive X or a, yeah, Vive XR Elite. Uh, 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 June has a... Um, What's it called? The the Vive Focus Vive 3. Focus 3, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because all these headsets are going to behave a little bit differently. And one thing that like I honestly don't think we're going to fix before tomorrow, but it's good to know, is like people have reported when they open this with a Valve Index, Steam VR is working, hooray, but the controllers are rotated like 90 degrees. And it's like weird. And there's not a super easy way to just run a check to be like, is someone using the Valve Index? If so, you know, rotate controllers into the correct position. Um, and even if we could do that check, because we don't have a Valve Index, we don't know like exactly 
exactly what that rotation should be. So it's very difficult to get all this working for multiple platforms. Um, I do wonder if by this time next year, we'll be talking about how we ported the whole thing for standalone headsets like the Vive Focus 3 and, and MetaQuest 3 and that kind of stuff. Or the Apple Vision Pro. Or the Apple Vision Pro. That would be pretty cool. I'd love to say there's an, a tabletop AR version of this that you can just uh, drop in the middle of your living room and watch it as like a little diorama thing. Um, one thing I'm hoping to get working by tomorrow that isn't working at the moment is I really love the way things like tilt brush work where you can like grab and move around the world and scale the whole thing up and down. And I did a, a little test a few months ago where this all felt really good with that. Um, but I didn't know if that was like a default movement system we'd want to have. So maybe by the live show tomorrow, we'll have a little like checkbox you can hit um, inside the menu that will allow you to activate like tilt brush mode and, and decide, do you want all the characters to look like they're a hundred feet tall, or do you want them all to feel like they're little action figures on your desk? Anyways, um, day, uh, David, <laughs> Jacob, how about you describe what you see June doing right now for our audio listeners? Yeah. Well, at the <laughs> moment I would describe it as Dickens hoisting, um, <laughs> Scrooge, like a, you know, a, a kitten gets, you know, like a, 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 a badly behaved kid. Yeah, it gets you know like carried by like the back of the neck by its mother kind of thing. It's a bit unsettling. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, but uh, I can't tell if it's unsettling because Scrooge becomes weightless and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, loses the you know the 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 fundamental essence of of Scrooge, or if it's because he looks like he's dead just goes limp but really you you should be watching this episode on youtube it, it, if if you have the ability jump onto youtube for for the end of this so you can watch these demos because they are pretty pretty fun by the way uh yes, speaking of this, yeah oh, yeah sorry go ahead jen i don't call this scrooge dead scrooge dead in our view. <laughs> yeah you just limp I love that we can just play with this stuff. Uh, by the way, I, I gave a shout out to our, our friends at the Ferryman Collective, and I just noticed we actually have uh, Braden Roy, one of the amazing co-founders, also the mayor of the Under Presents, fun fact, in the chat. And Braden wants to know if Ari, Debbie, or anyone else has run into issues with disorientation when they're swapping avatars and points of view on the fly rapidly, uh, or has that process been uh, seamless for them? How would you answer that, June? That's definitely difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a challenge. We, I think we spend like two or three or even more weeks just to fix the head rotation and the body, just to make sure like the head orientation is correct yeah. when swapping between avatars. Yeah, and we try to give them some clues to keep them oriented, like the big green upstage sign. So like as the sets are changing around them, they just have very easy things to help keep them in the correct orientation. One nice thing about virtual reality, of course, that we can't do in the real world is we can have very clear markers and things that only um, certain people can see and other people can't. Again, we can divide things up into like crew performers, uh, audience members. Uh, is this your view right now, June? Yeah, so the, yeah. yeah, this this is the uh, view from um, SRV. Uh, so we can see that uh, in the third person view, we also have this kind of marker to show uh, the front, the front being the uh, avatar's front. <laughs> so because I am in, I'm actually like in a third person view right now. So if I just rotate 180 degree, um, well, well, now I, I can show that, but <laughs> if I uh, hide this, and if I just rotate 180 degree, <laughs> the content, the content would just be like, you yeah. know, non, non human, not human. Anymore. So yeah, we 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 do this kind of um, like small diagrams to help with the orientation here and there. Yeah. We did have a lot of fun. We did we did a demo of this at Unreal Fest and then also for the real-time conference using Radical AI, which is a markerless mocap solution that just uses a webcam. And we had Ari and Dante giving a bit of a demo of what that looks like. And the answer is very good. Uh, we just haven't been able to incorporate it into the experience uh, because of the fact that it doesn't currently work with um, builds and there's some other like complexities about getting it all out. But I think we are excited about adding more ways that our performers can 
uh, do their show, you know, whether it's entirely from within a VR headset uh, or using a webcam or using a motion capture suit. Uh, it's nice that there's more and more options that are affordable and easy for a performer to do from the comfort of their living room. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so frustrated with Meta because uh, some of the IK stuff they have is really, really excellent. And they've brought a lot of it to like Unity. They have not done any of it for uh, Unreal Engine yet. And the stuff that they have done for Unreal Engine has very poor documentation. So, you know, I, I it, it hurts me to think about how much June and some of the other members of our development team have had to build a bunch of things from scratch that do actually exist. We just haven't been able to access them. Um, oh, fun little thing too, is when Ari jumps back and forth between Scrooge and Dickens, there's kind of this little like spirit Niagara particle effect um, that we can see there a little bit. Yeah. So if you're, if you're watching very closely, you can kind of almost feel like it's Ari's soul jumping between these characters to possess <laughs> them. <laughs> it looks like Dickens is about to kiss Scrooge or something. There's like a little bit of a, <laughs> yeah, it's very romance. intimate scene you're showing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So for the past couple of weeks, our Rococo suit has been down and Ari and Debbie have both been entirely in VR. Um, we did manage to get Ari all the wires he needs to manually repair the Rococo suit himself. And so for Friday and Saturday, hopefully we will be in full body mocap and you won't just see uh, them standing up the whole time. <laughs> That'll be fun. Cool. Well, I feel like we're covering a lot of ground here. Jacob, do you have any other questions about this? uh fun monstrosity of a show <laughs> <laughs> no i i mean i i think people should definitely uh check it out if they haven't um I, yeah i i think it's just exciting to see how much you guys invest to, in, in this every year um and to see it you know continue to to improve and and you're pushing you know boundaries in, in very interesting ways um so definitely people should check it out if they haven't um or, you know, if you got a, a nice checkbook, you know, maybe sponsor next year's performance. <laughs> I'll give, I'll, look, if you don't want to do the shameless plug, I'll do it. You know. Thank you, Jacob. We'll, we'll give you a commission for anyone who comes on board <laughs> and is like, yes, take $12. I'll give you donation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll send you pizza. And then... <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, the thing is that it's a fun way for us to take a lot of what we've learned over client work over the year. And the goal really is to be able to say, hey, Ferryman Collective or folks who, you know, act in other shows and in things like Mozilla Hubs, we were doing stuff with like Onboard XR and, and WebXR, um, other people from other theater companies, whether they are involved in tech or not, we want to be able to give them these tools and have it be as straightforward as possible for them to put on their own shows. And uh, we're just dog fooding it all right now. We're doing it ourselves. And one of our goals for 2024 is to get these hands into the tools of other performers and creators. And for us also to crank out a lot more quick shows that maybe take a week to produce rather than a couple months. <laughs> so quick um, question as we kind of you know, close things out here, you know, given that this is a, a, an opportunity for you guys to explore new things inside of Unreal or, or try things, you know, for the first time, I'm going to ask both of you to maybe point to what was the, the, the most surprising thing you learned about Unreal Engine in the process of building this year's Christmas gift. And, and June, you, why don't you start? Um, our room is always full of surprises, I think. Um, most surprising thing... Well, I think the... It, um, I think the most surprising thing, or, or maybe it's not a surprise for many people, but for, for me, I think it's... Uh, our room is actually really flexible. Um, because well, um, we we kind of Frankenstein a lot of system to build our system, and it's really good to um, to be able to find a plugin that can do OSC and find another plugin that can do WebSocket client, and then find yet another plugin that can do WebSocket server. We are kind of Frankenstein like all these kind of systems, and even Google Sheet <laughs> into our system. Yeah. 
uh, to make this happen. So we, quick, we, yeah. Quick on that, June, one thing we didn't mention was like, one thing we were really nervous about was we thought we were going to have to ask everyone who came to the show to like manually open ports on their router, right, which yeah. would have been a nightmare. But a lot of the logic that the team built that was done for that kind of system using OSC and port forwarding and all that was able to be brought over to like a WebSocket system, which did not need that. Yeah, I mean, not, none of our team are like uh, very networking experts. We are just kind of try and error and found, oh, this method doesn't require port forwarding. <laughs> Great. So we're just like trying to make it happen. And then we kind of made it happen. And I really, really put, um, surprisingly, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it gave us a lot of like flexibility to um, combine with different systems, I think. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, Unreal Engine is a minefield. And no matter how much you learn about it, there will always be things that have you banging your head against the wall. Um, I definitely expected if, if I had told myself, you know, eight years ago when I first started using Unreal that uh, I might spend an entire day uh, trying to get Steam VR to not be a black screen when I'm the only person getting a black screen and no one else is. And then the solution, as like June discovered, was like, oh, you need to uninstall virtual desktop and have this particular setting in Steam VR. Like, it's this kind of stuff that there's no documentation for this stuff. It's all trial and error, and you either figure it out or you don't, and you find a workaround. And to be working in this industry, especially one like VR, where everything is, uh, changing all the time uh, and doesn't have as many users active, you just need to be willing to like try, 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 try and not give up and uh, and just figure it out <laughs> or do your best. Um, so as long as you have the kind of mentality to know that it's never going to get easier, just different, then you are <laughs> in the right place because it is kind of like a drug addiction, right? Like when things are working, like I had one really good development night where there were like nine things on the list of like nice to have features for the production. I was able to knock off and every one of them worked the first time I put on the headset. That feels great. That's thrilling. But then yes, there are other times when you spend several days trying to make a thing work that should be so simple and it's just not. <laughs> yeah, I, I I find this that that true of, of most technology that you have that you develop any sort of expertise in right like there's always a deeper rabbit hole when it comes to these things um and you you get more ambitious you know in in lockstep with how much you learn because everything you learn just opens up oh well what if i use this for this this and this so i think alex is right like it, it's not it doesn't become easier it's different and usually the challenges you're facing might seem, you know, just as trivial as the ones you were dealing with when you started using something like Unreal Engine. But in the end, the outcome is going to be way better, right? Yeah. <laughs> because you, you've done the cycles to understand what it is you need to bang your head against that actually produces the, you know, what what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that's true of just about any technology or that you try and learn or or any sort of May, probably any task you put your mind to is that, that you really develop expertise and, and and Unreal Engine is just, it goes deep enough that it, it fits into that kind of category. And there is something very fun about feeling like you're trying something out that has never been done before. And Unreal Engine, of course, covers so many industries. So like we're taking things like OSC or, you know, the way we're doing stuff with MetaHumans or Live MoCap or the VCam, and we're repurposing all those things in a new way. And sometimes it breaks because it wasn't designed for that. Uh, and sometimes it works surprisingly well. And we feel like we, you know, all deserve to eat some cake. Um, one thing I want to mention before I forget is we do have another question in the chat. Um, Space Wrecked says, thoughts on physical slash on location room scale MR and XR experiences. Um, I'm a caveman to basic blueprint knowledge, so this is my path. Do you want to answer that? Um, I'll, I'll mention briefly that uh, we do do stuff sometimes that is on location. It is always interesting when you're trying to program things for a particular place. Uh, we have a poster in the lobby for Christmas Carol for a production we did called Ghosted, which was on Magic Leap and was designed for a very specific 
uh, location and setup. And that's interesting when you're like, people are going to be sitting at this table and this is the stuff in the environment. And we want all of that to be part of the show instead of things being entirely virtual. Everything with uh, Apple is going to be very much with that as a consideration because you can literally dial up and down how much of the real world you see. And if you want the real world to be any part of what's going on, then that becomes a really big design consideration. And you have to find yourself thinking about how do I procedurally have things that will always work as long as there's a table or a chair? And how do I have things that are like, well, we really need to like get rid of the real world and have everything be virtual. Um, for this to be effective correctly. I'll also give a quick shout out to a production we're working on for next year called Ink and Paint, uh, which will be opening probably sometime in April. And it's basically Who Framed Roger Rabbit live in a physical theater with like AR characters moving around a space. And there's elements that you will see regardless of whether or not you're using an AR device. Um, and so the mixing and matching of like, how do you make something feel magical? And how do you make the tech feel like it's servicing narrative and story without it feeling like a gimmick? Um, that's always a, a really interesting challenge. What do you think, June? I think from an architectural mm -hmm. architectural background, I think um, room scale VR is really um, um, it's really amazing and, and attracts me a lot because I, I think the, the major difference for me about uh, VR with, or XR, this kind of tools, uh, different from the traditional 2D screen is that we have the sense of scale. So we can use our physical body to so just experience the, the world, the virtual world that is um, that's presented to us by uh, by grabbing our by stealing our our visual and um, sound system uh, to fake it, and with the the actual space to uh, play with and to to just kind of to um, experience it is just make it even more um, um, deliverable. So. Uh, yeah, and like the Four Seasons project we uh, briefly mentioned is the full room scale VR project. I, that that I think uh, gave well, room scale is an understatement there. <laughs> yeah, it's a what is like five thousand square feet garage scale or <laughs> like yeah. Um, yeah, well, I do hope there are more that kind of project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think he's also wondering about the development side of it. Like one thing we're trying to do, um, June and I and the other developers at Agile Lens, we're trying to post more examples of things because there just aren't enough, especially in Unreal Engine. So if you're if you're trying to figure out like the blueprints and, and how to get started with a lot of this stuff, like um, Dante put together a really nice pass-through example that lets you like toggle between the real world and the virtual world um, in Unreal Engine setup for Meta. And, um, and, you know, a lot of the tools we're building now, we have a thing called like Agile Lens Utility Nodes. Um, we want to try to make a lot of these tools available so others don't have to suffer the same way we've suffered to do what in many cases should be relatively straightforward tasks. I think one other uh, aspect that, um, or like the, the biggest uh, problem with room scale or like just uh, the, the effort of trying to sync the virtual space and the actual space is always the, the different coordination. <laughs> Like yeah. we know in Unreal, Unreal has its own virtual coordination and our headset has its own um, coordination. And if uh, like in Four Seasons, we use OptiTrack. OptiTrack also has its own coordination that uh, that, that, that they, they uh, use to um, just label the position of the space. And so the, the, the real problem is always within how to sync every coordination and make sure they are all talking to the same point in the space. It's the biggest pain. Yeah. But that's the thing too, is Unreal Engine can talk to all these things, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. through different protocols, but it's all possible. And sometimes we end up doing things that are incredibly complicated just because we know it's possible. Even if it isn't probable and it's not how something is designed, uh, we get really excited when we realize that something is not outright impossible. Um, speaking of things like OptiTrack, uh, I've got this fun Iron Man hand here. I'm actually wearing it backwards because I wasn't looking at how I put it on. Someone who we brought on to Agile Lens for the Four Seasons Project, his name is Sam Baker. He just uh, released this Indiegogo campaign or it's, they're shipping now for, uh, ooh, what are they called? The um, uh, Frostbite haptic gloves or something like that. 
and um, they're awesome. So they're they were like two hundred dollars, and it's got these systems in here that actually pull back to make you feel like there's actually tension on things. And also on top of here, I've got the Vive Ultimate Tracker, which is one way that this can detect where you are in space. But like this is a new piece of technology that might be able to replace all the stuff we're doing with OptiTrack because if if you have five of these, they all know where they are in a relative position to uh, each other. And so we could put one of these on the heads of five different people in a MetaQuest Pro. And in theory, all that data could be shared and it's all inside out. So then, you know, no more need for $300,000 in OptiTrack equipment, maybe. So it's interesting with the Four Seasons project that we're going to have opportunities to keep doing R&D as new software, hardware, et cetera, comes out uh, to kind of stay on the bleeding edge. And hopefully it will inform all the fun, wacky theater projects we do as well. Yeah. Awesome. I, I feel like this has been a, a really great deep dive into what you guys have, have done here. Um, obviously, a ton has changed. Uh, any any uh, final thoughts here before we wrap up the podcast tonight? All I'd say is tenacity and just reminding people that like, you you got to be willing to push through when things aren't working uh, or find workarounds. Like if something actually is giving you a headache for three days, uh, jump over to something else. Uh, I practice something I like to call productive procrastination, which is I try to have like a list of like five to 10 things uh, where it's like, maybe this is the most important thing and this is the least important thing. And I might jump over and procrastinate from the most important thing by doing the least important thing, but it is still something that needs to get done. And then like, no matter what, something useful is happening. And just by making your brain tackle different kinds of problems, which is very easy to do with how widespread Unreal Engine development is, uh, I think it's a good way to uh, solve problems, even if they aren't the problem you need to necessarily be solving at that particular moment. It also really helps to have a good team. So this year, having more people to work with, um, June and I have been able to expand to a lot of other really talented developers. Even if you're remote, having a good Slack or Discord where you can all you know, share ideas and bounce off each other and get other eyes on something, um, that makes a huge difference. Um, but you know, it's all worth it. It's all worth it when you get to say you made something that is uh, super exciting and maybe the first of its kind. Maybe it feels a little bit like we're the early days of ILM or Pixar where we're like touching all these things, thinking like, maybe this is a thing, maybe it's not. Oh, cool, there's something here. Let's keep going with it. Um, and please, everyone do come see Christmas Carol uh, Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Saturday, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Sunday, live stream all day of pre-recorded content. We'll leave the YouTube chat open if people want to say hi to us or to each other. Um, that's all I have to say. June, how about you? Um, yeah, that's probably about what all I want to say as well. But and I want to shout out to our other people in the dev team. Uh, thank you, Dante and Josie and Ari K and Sarah. Um, and also all the, the crew members that are not um, dev team. <laughs> Sorry if I miss anyone, but Steph and Jackie and Carlos and John. And uh, we also have one new camera person. Sorry, I forgot the name. John. But... His name's John. <laughs> oh, I already, I already had John. I thought oh, we have a John, third one. It's John Carl. Oh, there was another one. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's one that. more, but the very fresh one. Um, yeah. And, and of course, Devin. And, I'm sorry, Kevin and David. Uh, everyone should go. Their name to xmascarolvr.com slash credits. Or when you come to the show, we do have the credits roll at the end when we take you back to the lobby. So yeah, it's been a really wonderful team. Uh, we're really lucky to be among such awesome people. And uh, sorry, Sam Baker, it's called the Bifrost Pulse VR Haptic Glove. Definitely want to give that a proper shout out. It's super cool. Everyone should check it out. <laughs> yeah, and please come see the show. Yeah. Awesome. Well, at, at that, I'll... Uh... I'll go ahead and say, hey, if you listen to this point in the <laughs> podcast, you're a super fan. You're a super fan. You got you, you can leave us a like or subscribe or or any of those things. And happy holidays to those of you who are listening to this in time for that to be relevant. Or you know what? Whatever holiday it is. Happy happy holiday. Exclamation point. All right. Yeah. And well, uh we'll catch you in the new year. 
2024. Um, if anyone is going to be in Mesa, Arizona at ASU at the beginning of the year, uh, Kevin and I will be there showing some stuff related to Christmas Carol. And we'll talk more about this at another time, but kind of the, the entertainment gamified version of all this, which we call line, uh, which is really meant to be kind of a, a VR karaoke theater game. So little tease of that more on that in the future. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your year. And yeah, see you again. And thank you, June, for joining us. Thank you so much, June. This is very last minute. I yeah. asked June 10 minutes before we were going to start yeah. if she wanted to come talk about like leading the development team on this project. And uh, thank you for being game, June. You're always uh, amazing and a delight. And I feel very lucky that we've been able to work together for a few years now. Yeah, All thank right. you for the name. <laughs> it's fun. All right. Catch everyone later. Goodbye. <laughs>